Today, for my lab tour, I'll be introducing to you guys about fiber-based quantum communication technology. So uh, I'm sure before lunch, you guys have learned a lot about QKD, and you understand the, the motivation behind uh, quantum communication, which is to enhance the security of our current communication protocols and uh, ensure that a lot of the things that we use in our day-to-day -day lives, such as uh, encryption in WhatsApp messages and encryption in, uh, in our internet banking remain safe in the future. So now let me go and talk about what is uh, exactly fiber-based quantum communication. So um, in my field of research in fiber-based quantum communication, uh, the fiber actually refers to the exact same optical fiber that we use in our broadband internet. So uh, this optical fiber has been developed since uh, 1984. And today, most of us, most if not all of us, have uh, fiber internet access to our homes. This means that all of us are already connected in a vast array of uh, optical fiber network, which enables us to communicate with each other. So fiber-based quantum communication technology is a hot topic of research because by leveraging on this already existing network, it enables us to, de uh, to deliver uh, quantum communication technology uh, more easily to the public. So what exactly is the difference between classical and quantum uh, fiber-based communication? So um, in, let's talk a bit about the similarities first. So in classical and quantum communication, we both convey our information over the system uh, in a form of bits, uh, strings of bits of ones and zeros. In classical communication, uh, these bits are actually uh, are carried by uh, optical pulses, opti uh, waves of optical pulses. The presence or absence of these pulses within a single time slot represents ones and zeros. But in quantum communication, we have to look at it from a photon point of view. And while the, uh, in the photon picture, the information are also conveyed as bits which can be in the presence or absence of a photon in a particular time slot. A photon also has other characteristics, uh, such as the polarization, which can enable us to encode information in, in other ways uh, to be conveyed to different parties. So perhaps we can have uh, a horizontal polarization as uh, to represent the bit number one, and vertical polarization to represent the bit number zero. Uh, so these are these are the similarities and slight differences between uh, classical and quantum communication technology. And in classical uh, communication technology, what we use are lasers and modulators. Modulators are basically devices which controls the laser beam. So by shaping the laser beam into individual pulses, we we transmit them. Uh, we we can transmit these pulses in a form of bits. But in quantum communication, to produce these photons, we require a laser, and in my case, uh, a nonlinear crystal to produce this kind of photon pairs. Uh, let me show a close up of what a nonlinear crystal looks like and how we produce uh, these photon pairs in uh, our field of research. So, what you see here are an array of, uh, opti of optical devices on what we call an optical table. The laser beam will come through here. Uh, you can't see the laser in this in, uh, in my screen but, uh, because it's on my left. But the laser beam will come through here and you'll pass through a series of elements which uh, controls the property of the laser such that the efficiency of conversion of uh, uh, the efficiency of, efficiency of production of the photon pairs will be at, the, at its highest once it passes into the crystal. The crystal is actually located here uh, in this copper block centered in the middle of the screen. Um, this crystal is located within this, uh, this copper block because the copper block is required to precisely tune the temperature of the crystal to enhance the efficiency of the photon pass production. So what exactly makes this, uh, this communication quantum, in a sense, is that the processes that takes place within this nonlinear crystal and our understanding of, uh, of light in the form of photons requires a quantum mechanical interpretation of physics and light in order, uh, in order to explain these processes. 
So this is where the, the quantum part comes in. And uh, in, in our quantum communication, I would like to give an, a brief overview of uh, the, the, system, the, the system that takes place behind uh, this quantum communication. So uh, in our case, we produce uh, photon pairs that are distributed to the relevant parties uh, that, wish to be that, that wish to communicate with each other, which is uh, Alice and Bob in our case. And uh, so in this, in this overall picture, we have a source, a transmission medium, which in our case is the optical fiber, and then we have a detector unit. Uh, the detector unit would be where Alice and Bob are situated. And the source is where the nonlinear crystal is, as I explained earlier. Uh, in, this, in, uh, in, in this process, uh, the photons are transmitted over optical fiber and to the parties. And in our research, uh, what we are trying to do is we have to enhance this process of uh, enhance the efficiency of communication between the two parties. So we're always looking at ways to, uh, to, to mitigate the disadvantages or the weaknesses of this form of communication, and also try to perhaps develop new devices to improve uh, fiber-based quantum uh, communication technology. Uh, but most of all, most importantly, we always have to do a test run uh, in, our, in our lab to see how well we can communicate with each other. And in the process of doing this test run, we have to mimic the distances between uh, two separate parties. That means in the real world, when Alice and Bob are communi communicating with each other, they are likely to be uh, maybe tens of kilometers apart from each other. Or in the case of Singapore, maybe up to 40 plus kilometers away from each other. So how do we perform this kind of experiments in a lab? Is that we actually have, um, <laughs> compact spools of optical fiber, which can go from one to 10 to even 50 kilometers to emulate the distances uh, that, we, that we are going to have to travel in real life to reach uh, Alice and Bob. So uh, this covers the, the medium part of the uh, quantum communication. And lastly, in quantum communication, we have to talk about the detectors. So in, in, the, in the single photon picture, we have to understand that the detection of single photons is a lot more difficult than the detection of a strong laser pulse in classical communication. So the devices that we use for the detection of single photons has to be a lot more sensitive than what we currently have. And over here in CQT, we have an array of single photon detectors. And one of it is, uh, is the device over here which is the superconducting nanowire single photon detector, which in terms of the performance capabilities, uh, it is one of the best single photon detectors we have uh, in the world. So uh, how does this single photon uh, detector work? Is that we have a very narrow, a very thin uh, nanometer sized piece of wire that is cooled down to temperatures of about 2.4 Kelvin very close to zero Kelvin. And what happens when this piece of wire is cooled down to zero Kelvin, uh, to close to zero Kelvin, is that it exhibits superconducting properties. Uh, for example, it exhibits uh, no electrical resistance. And we can detect, and we can detect the property of this uh, nanowire. When a single photon, just one photon, lands on this, uh, piece, of, this piece of wire, it produces enough energy to raise the temperature of the nanowire to a point where it's above the superconducting threshold. And once it escapes the superconducting threshold, uh, we can detect this change in the physical property of the nanowire. And this is how we know that a single photon has actually uh, impinged on the nanowire itself. To establish 2.4 Kelvin, uh, it's actually no trivial task because any interaction with the environment will cause a raise in temperature. So as you guys can hear and probably uh, probably hear and see from this uh, device here, what we have is a ultra high vacuum that is maintained by a constant pump. Uh, this ultra high vacuum is required because even the interaction of gas molecules with the nanowire itself can actually transfer enough energy to heat up the wire. So we need this ultra high vacuum in order to maintain such cool temperatures in a in the nanowire detector. 
So uh, this this about sums up my my overall picture of uh, fiber based quantum communication and how we put, how we conduct our experiments in a lab and the kind of devices that we use. Uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask me. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, now, do we have any questions from the audience? Thank you very much. Um, while the audience is writing down their questions, may I ask one? Oh, sure. Thanks. So what would happen if you um, change the temperature of this copper block? Would the efficiency change uh, or the color or? Uh, the, first of all, the efficiency will change. And second of all, the wavelength of the photons, that means the color of the light that comes out will be different. Uh, why is this so? It's because the temperature of the, of the, of the crystal uh, determines the, the crystal lattice or the, the positions of the, the atoms in the crystal. So by heating, up the, by heating up the crystal or cooling the crystal, what you're doing is that you're causing thermal expansion or contraction to the size of the crystal. And the crystal requires very specific dimensions to enable the process known as a spontaneous parametric down conversion uh, to take place, which is the process that en enables the production of the entangled photon pairs that we use for our communication. Thanks a lot. Okay, we have two questions about the photon detector. So the first one is, what happens when more than one photon impinges on the wire? Uh, so the, th the, uh, the, the thing is this, uh, the wire is made to be very, very thin so that the process of it heating up and cooling back down takes place very, very quickly. We're talking about, uh, we're talking about on the scale of like, uh, my, 10 to the power of minus 10 seconds. So statistically, uh, there's, there's a particular statistic involved in the, in, in the production of these photon pairs. And for the most part, uh, one photon will land on the wire, it will heat up, and by the time, uh, by the, time the second photon is expected to arrive statistically onto the wire, the wire will cool down back to its, <clears throat> back to its original state. And by the time it cools down back to its original state, it will be able to detect the next photon. There is, of course, a case where more than one photon uh, lands on the wire. Then in this case, we might, uh, the device might not detect uh, the two separate photons, but you might see just one photon. So uh, in our experimentation, there are always certain sources of error that we have to try to uh, correct for uh, to, to reduce the amount of error in our communication. And in this, in this case for the detector, there's also something known as a detector blinding. That means if we send in way too many photons to the detector in one, in one shot, and it doesn't have sufficient time to cool back down to its original superconducting state, then the detector will be at a state where, it's called, where it is called it has latched. And once it has latched, it will not be able to actually detect the occurrence of the next photons. But this requires a very, very strong source. And for the most part, uh, the, the, amount, the amount of photon pairs that we produce in experimentally has not been high enough for it to be uh, much of a concern. But as I mentioned earlier, we are always trying to develop uh, tools, uh, better tools to facilitate quantum communication. Because as we want to improve, improve this te communication technology, just like our internet, we always want it to be faster. We always want to communicate more information per unit time. So as we want to push this limit, uh, we have to also push the capabilities of our detectors. And all these are all under research. Thanks, Raymond. Uh, there's, a, there's more questions on the detectors and there are a few about the temperature. So the first one is why must the wire be cooled to such a low temperature and can't the wire be a material that exhibits superconductivity at a higher temperature? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, because for the, <clears throat> in terms of the room temperature superconductivity, uh, in terms of materials that exhibit superconductivity at closer to room temperatures, this is actually a very, very new field of research that uh, some of my, my friends who are doing a PhD in materials and uh, material sciences are actually currently developing. So, uh, if we're talking about materials which are good enough for us to do into commercial devices right now, 
they, uh, unfortunately, there are uh, materials such as uh, particular types of metals that only exhibits this kind of uh, superconducting temperatures at such low temperature, uh, as such uh, superconducting uh, properties at such low temperatures. So in the future, if we have, uh, if we finally develop materials that can exhibit superconducting properties at closer to room temperature, it might be, it might be possible for us to try to develop a, a new generation of superconducting nanowire detectors for use in uh, for use in our communication technology. Uh, we have another question. Uh, is just the vacuum enough to achieve the low temperature, or is the vacuum there just to keep the environment clean to prevent heat transfer with things like dust? Oh, the the vacuum itself is to is to maintain the temperature once it has been cooled down to that. Uh, particular temperature. But the mechanism behind cooling uh, is more than just the vacuum itself. Okay, um, we have one question that's more broadly about quantum communications. So what are the advantages of the quantum base over the classical type of communication? Uh, for the quantum case, um, there are many ways to facilitate quantum communication. Uh, in terms of <clears throat> QKD, we have like the, the BD84 protocol, but we also but we also have uh, other types of protocols uh, that re that relies on properties such as uh, entanglement based quantum key distribution. And in this en entanglement based quantum key distribution, the security of this communication is foolproof as long as the things are as long as uh, everything is conducted uh, properly. We can uh, we can test for the presence of this entanglement. And once we are sure that the, the photon pairs are entangled, we are sure that the only relevant parties have access to this uh, to the have access to the information that we are trying to communicate. So in our case, would be the distribution of quantum keys. Uh, we, so the distribution of quantum keys can be proven to be uh, only only obtained by the relevant parties if we can test for the presence of uh, quantum entanglement. So uh, this allows us a, a sure a, a sure fire way of determining that the communication between both parties are secure. But classically, there's uh there's there's no such way to to ensure that the quantum key is safely distributed. And the, the there's uh, in classically there's no way to ensure that the encryption key is safely distributed. So in quantum key distribution, once you ensure that the encryption key is safely distributed, you can use this encryption key in conjunction with uh, particular encryption methods, such as the, the one-time pack encryption method to ensure that the communication between both parties is secure. So in the one-time pack, your encryption key has to be as long as the message itself. But once it is the case, then the encryption method is foolproof. Thanks, Raymond. Uh, we have one more question, and it is how do you test for entanglement? How do you test for entanglement? So uh, there's put, there are particular uh, statistics uh, that you can detect when you uh, when the two photons uh, are entangled. They exhibit particular uh, behavior which can be tested statistically uh, upon upon the detection. Uh, this is a uh, this is a field that's tested by uh, some colleagues of mine uh, where they test something known as the CHSH inequality. Uh, to de to determine whether uh, the two photo the, the 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 photons detected are entangled with each other. So uh, perhaps in a, if you guys have a few more lecture series, they might touch upon the CHSH inequality to further elaborate on this uh, uh how to statistically test for uh, the presence of entanglement. Thank you, Raymond. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Maybe a quick comment. Um, yes, we will cover that in tomorrow's lecture on um, Bell non-locality. But maybe um, a, an experimental comment. You, because tomorrow will be a theoretical treatment, you basically have um, some polarization optics and you turn them in specific angles with res in different detection arms. And depending on the angles at which you um, turn these polarization optics, you create different types of measurement setups and you collect the statistics for each of these um, angles. 
And based on that, you can calculate this inequality. More, more about that tomorrow. More about that tomorrow. Any other questions for Ray Ming from the audience? If not, then Angelina, maybe back to you. Thank you, Ray Ming. Oh, wait. Oh, we have one more. Uh, what is the typical size for one equipment? Typical size. Okay, so um, the, the one that you see uh, on the on the table here, they measure they measure by about uh, just a, a couple of uh, centimeters in width and about maybe 10 centimeters in, in height. So uh, this is the, 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 the general uh, optical setup that we have to produce the kind of uh, to, to produce the entangled photon pairs. Uh, but of course it might seem a little bit bulky. And to commercialize it, we have to miniaturize the products to be able to cap, to, to be able to be able to enable the products to be kept in perhaps a small box. And uh, this is this is uh, something that is there are these particular designs that are being under they are under research as well to produce such um, compact miniaturized uh, modules. So over here in CQT, we also have extremely small, maybe uh, just 10 centimeter size boxes that can produce the entangled photon pairs at quite a high efficiency. Uh, these are the ones that we, uh, we we put them into the satellites uh, for it to be launched to space. 